Sunshine Week is an annual event that is so very important to people who care about informed consent and a democracy. If you want to have a society where we can make our own decisions collectively and come up with the best decisions, we really need to have freedom of information. What it allows for is that any citizen, anyone in the whole society has the right to go in and get access to public information and public records. And you can look at the actual original source and make up your own mind. So in this time when misinformation and people are spinning things, the ability to go back to the ground, to the original fact point, to the information as presented, and to, for yourself, make up your own mind, or to share that information then with your community, this is how we ensure that we have a healthy democracy. So it's so fundamental that every year we try to celebrate Sunshine Week, and we hope that you'll join us. All right, I'll say hello and welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining us. It's uh, been a long week of sunshine. We had uh, two really great panels earlier this week uh, that talked about the media landscape of the North Coast and um, Humboldt County specifically, especially some of our inland uh, communities. And then we talked about the future of what the landscape uh, and the direction is heading. Um, and so today we wanted to talk about uh, Listening Post Collectives with uh, Internews and Jesse Hardman, specifically uh, from Internews, which I'll pass the mic to them in a moment. Uh, we thought it would be an interesting topic to bring up because uh, Access Humboldt has been developing our own Listening Post. Um, and, uh, you know, we take a lot of it, inspiration from the work that Internews does in uh, sharing information and providing access. Um, so I'll go ahead and ask folks if um, they'll just go ahead and mute themselves so that we can give Jesse the floor and um, I will invite him to speak about his work with the Listening Post Collective, kind of, you know, what the main idea is, maybe give us a summary and just kind of um, how that tool is used over at Internews. Hey, thanks so much. It's nice to be here. I wish I was uh, around you all in person, but this is the next best thing. Um, <clears throat> so I, uh, I've been working for Internews, uh, your neighbor in Arcata, since 2007. And I have a journalism background. I worked mostly in public media as a reporter. And I kind of found myself frustrated with the follow through from most mainstream media in terms of who is included both in, in coverage, but also in um, <clears throat> making sure that people saw the reporting um, that we were doing and making sure they could access it. And at least from a public media background, you know, there was kind of this attitude where if you put it on the radio, um, you know, the right people will hear it and that's all that mattered. And uh, yeah, it just ate at me over time because a lot of the communities I, I, I was covering and, and kind of interested in covering um, were public radio listeners. And I felt there was this gap between what I was doing and, and who actually was accessing what I was doing. So it kind of, put me in this direction of um, finding Internews at some point, um, which is uh, an organization that is dedicated to information access to everybody, especially communities um, that are often left out of the conversation. And I worked for Internews in Sri Lanka during the civil war there, um, making sure that families fleeing a war zone got the information they needed to rebuild their lives. And that was a really kind of formative experience for me. We had a radio show, we had a newspaper, we started text messaging, which way back in 2007, wasn't something you saw even in the US, but, but there it was this great way to reach people with um, critical information. So um, that was kind of my 
initial foray into um, working for internews, but also in really like leaning into making communities a, a collaborator in work and not just viewing them as an audience. Um, really like getting feedback from them, um, making sure that their voices were present in programming, um, making sure the topics that were um, of interest that they needed more information about were things that were covered. And I um, worked for Internews in a few other spots around the world, but I really kind of remembered that initial inkling, which is that this is, you know, definitely needed in the United States where I'm actually from. So maybe I ought to uh, take a look at how to do that. Um, and so in 2013, we started the Listening Post Collective in New Orleans. And um, that's a city that I had done some reporting in, but I certainly wasn't from there. And so what I did was I took this um, assessment model that Internews uses pretty much everywhere they work and, and applied it to New Orleans. And essentially, you know, some of you have worked on the great assessment that, um, that, um, that uh, Access Humboldt did. And it's essentially a really deep listening exercise and really making sure that you're talking to community leaders and uh, local residents and getting a better understanding of on any given day, if you really needed to get some information, how would you do it? Um, and kind of building around those networks that, that they're most likely to use, that they trust. Um, so I applied that model in New Orleans, which is a very low income city. It's a post disaster city. This was 2013. So Katrina uh, was still very present in that city in terms of um, a lot of the neighborhoods, uh, traditional neighborhoods in New Orleans. Um, and what I learned in my listening exercise was that increasingly everybody had a cell phone and that that was probably a smart way to try and connect with people. Um, and so we started with, I'm somewhat aware of, one of the first kind of news text messaging services in the country uh, in New Orleans. And we made sure that it, it reached deep into neighborhoods that again, weren't places you tended to hear from, or if you did hear about them, they were places that were reported in a very singular manner for mostly for violence. Um, and, um, and we also, leveraged community spaces where people told us they hung out and and got and shared information like local libraries and, and businesses to give people opportunities to record um, reactions to important topics um, tell us stories those sorts of things and so that was kind of the first um, attempt to apply what what internews uh, supports um, everywhere but the united states here in the united states um, and yeah, it was a really exciting thing. Not all of the things we tried worked, but we definitely, I think, got an interesting beat on the heart of communities in New Orleans that, that traditionally were left out of the conversation. And from there, um, yeah, more people heard about us. People were interested in and doing the kind of work that we were doing. And, and one thing I think is always important to share is the, the idea of an information ecosystem assessment or this deep listening exercise, which I recently spent a year doing it in the Inland Empire in Southern California. And um, yeah, it really took a year and it was during COVID. So it couldn't necessarily happen in the way that, that I like doing it, which is more out in the world. A lot of it happened online. And so you're always pivoting and figuring out how to listen differently and better. Um, but it's often an exercise that media outlets um, in particular, but you know, anyone interested in doing this kind of work, I think tend to shy away from because it really takes some commitment. And so when we started the listening post, the attention was on text messaging because that was exciting and it was tech related and it seemed like a quick fix. Um, oh, this is how we reach people now. And I think in retrospect, I wish I had kind of pushed more of this listening exercises, the actual innovative thing that we do at Internews because you know, as, as we're getting into almost 10 years of this project, um, that's the thing that we always do. That's the thing we always come back to. It's the first thing we always do. 
And it sets us up to actually reflect the community in what happens afterwards. And so I, I see a lot of tech and cool ideas come and go. Um, text messaging has taken off in some ways and not in others. I wouldn't say it's something everyone's like beating down the door to do. Um, WhatsApp is, is uh, kind of grown in that time in terms of reaching certain kinds of communities. So um, yeah, it's always kind of checking your what you think you know and actually listening and reflecting kind of what you heard. Now um, we're working all over the country um, and it's mostly these sorts of assessments leading to community investment and partnerships. Um, it's always in collaboration with communities. So it's never kind of landing an inner new spaceship somewhere that seems like it's a news desert and, um, you know, expecting a warm welcome. It's uh, quietly listening and making some friends and figuring out who wants to work on these kinds of issues and then taking it from there. Um, so yeah, at this point, um, we've evolved a lot. <clears throat> like I said, we're working in different places all over the country. We're still small. There's five people at Internews who work on this. Um, but what's exciting is just the more we share kind of our methodology and our strategies, um, the more I just see them in a lot of work out there. And again, like if you look at our website, which I shared here, which um, we're updating, but we have this, this playbook that a lot of people have used over time. Um, if you're a community organizer, a public health worker, um, uh, a small business owner, like these are likely all things that you've tried or had to use or, um, you know, um, tried to work with in your community. And so I'm always also really um, called to, to, to make sure that nobody ever thinks that these are things that we invented. Like this is stuff people have been doing forever. It's more of a reminder of why they're important to do. Um, there's a lot of kind of claiming of, of ideas out there, which, can help an organization and project get funding, but I'm always reticent to do that just because I've learned these things from all sorts of people and seen, you know, again, working in other countries, seen some of the most amazing things happen with the least amount of resources. And so um, I always want to make sure that people have a sense of, of yeah, our respect for all the communities that have used these tools because they haven't had more resources or because these made the most sense, um, but that they've been trying them long before, you know, we kind of put them all in one place. Um, so let me just conclude by saying um, our current work, we're doing assessments. Um, we're currently doing something in suburban Pennsylvania, looking at a growing Latino community there and uh, how to stimulate news information flow in that area. We've created a partnership of 10 BIPOC and immigrant community serving media that are part of a three year program where they'll get um, support, logistical support, fundraising help, um, and kind of just form a collaborative where they're helping each other to grow and to become more sustainable. And we're also um, doing research to to identify, I use the term news desert only so far as to, to point out that yes, there's parts of the country that uh, really do struggle to just even get basic local coverage. Um, but we always like to make sure that, that we're clear that um, a lot of communities have always been in news deserts in terms of how they're covered and how they're spoken to. And so as we look for these spaces, we're you know, identifying places that again, it's not a new thing. It's not that the paper just went out of business. It's that nobody ever really made that effort. Um, and so we're identifying locations around the US and looking for partners in those places because we really wanna work in the places where we're most needed and not just where um, there might be funding, but, but really try and focus in places that aren't um, aren't engaged in this sort of way. And, and as we do that, it, I keep coming back to like many, many parts of rural America are, are, are popping up on our radar a lot 
especially in the southeast of the U.S., but certainly countrywide, um, those are spaces that are really kind of um, uh, struggling the most. So we're really interested to kind of dive into that work and see how that might go. So that's what we're up to right now. Um, I guess I could ask for any, if anyone ha wants to ask any questions or um, happy to talk about any other aspect of this work. I will say it's been interesting to plant the seed inside a big organization that's used to, to funding itself through mostly through um, the US government and, and often very successfully getting great um, resources to do amazing work. And doing this in the US is a much different puzzle um, as I'm sure all of you at Access Humboldt know. Uh, fundraising around some of these issues, there's a lot of acknowledgement, but, but the amount of money and the time it takes to find private funding and, and to work with communities to support this sort of thing is a lot of work, as you all know. And so we're still learning how to go about this. In an ideal world, um, I really love this movement around one of our partners in Fresno, California, has been using the online tool Patreon to fund his work. And it's not quite there yet in terms of fully funding everything he wants to do, but he's up to, you know, about $1,000 a month just in local community members donating one to five dollars. Um, and it adds up. And so I think that's really exciting. That's the sort of thing when, when we think about how to make this work continue into the future. I'm really excited about how do we leverage community members who want to support this because you're making that effort to listen to them. And I think, you know, that's an untapped space uh, in a lot of parts of the US. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm wondering if anyone has any questions before I ask any questions. So, so this is David Frank. I'm a, a colleague of Jesse's uh, at Internews. Jesse, I, I can't believe it's been so long and I still haven't interviewed you yet. It's my, my I regret that probably more than most things in life because um, you're just a fascinating character. When I heard the origin story of Listening Post down in uh, New Orleans, it just seemed amazing to me. And, and there's so much we could talk about the present and so much we could talk about the future. But one part of the story I think people would like to hear is, can you tell us a little bit about when you first got going down there, when you first came up with this idea? You used public art as a way to collect um, input from folks and you, you put signs in the community as a way to stimulate conversation. Could you tell us a little bit about that, developing the relationship between the project and the community? Yeah, totally. I mean, one of the blessings of starting in New Orleans is uh, New Orleans kind of imposes itself on you whether or not you want it to, mostly in good ways. Um, but yeah, you can't walk down a street in New Orleans without seeing some sort of interesting public art. And I don't mean public art in the formal necessarily like somebody commissioned something. I mean, people communicate on the side of buildings, uh, you know, on, um, on telephone poles, on walls, at grocery stores. And so um, I created these public signs to grow participation in our text messaging program because um, there are just so many signs all over New Orleans asking different things. Uh, sometimes yeah, the signs are referring you to, um, you know, it, you'll see these all over America, but like foreclosed homes or in New Orleans, a lot of it has to do with like maintaining your property. So it's like we, we cut lawns. Um, because after Katrina, if you left and you still own that property and you didn't maintain it, you could lose, the, the city could reclaim that space. So there's all these interesting signs and, and conversations happening throughout the city. And I just wanted to be part of that conversation. And so we made these very simple signs. They were black and white. We silk screened them. And um, I think what worked about them was, and I still believe this, like a news conversation doesn't have to start with um, what do you think about taxes? Or uh, what do you think about housing policy? A news conversation, a long-term news conversation, information conversation, can start with something much simpler that, that is more accessible, that may be more on somebody's mind. 
And so these signs ask questions like, what's for dinner? Uh, why are you mad? Uh, who do you love? Like universal questions. And then there was the phone number for the text messaging program. And, um, and we got tons of responses. And it was just a really cool reminder of um, how you actually have a conversation with people. Like you wouldn't walk up to somebody at a party uh, necessarily and just start with like, did you vote for the library tax? I mean, you just wouldn't, you, you know, you're trying to find common ground. And so what was cool was as people responded to those questions, then they got a note saying, hey, this is actually a community news project and here's what we're doing. And if you'd like to participate, just stick around. And if you don't text the word no, and then uh, on a biweekly basis, they got questions about the city. So it went from what's for dinner to um, how do you use, uh, or do you have a bike and how do you use it in New Orleans? Um, how do you use the local library? Um, and it got into more of those like newsy questions. And so what, what we saw was somebody saying, you know, I love Deborah. <laughs> um, he cared about public libraries or he cared about um, road construction, things like that. And I just, it, for me, it was just such an interesting um, way to build conversation and to keep it going. And people stuck around, like very few people quit. Um, with the public art, we created these, um, I mean, New Orleans, Mardi Gras, parade floats. Um, these kind of look like mini things you might see on a Mardi Gras parade float. There was a tree and a fish and a telephone, and they would appear at a library or a grocery store and embedded in them were recording equipment. And each week or each couple of weeks, the question uh, on the side of it would change and you could self-record your experience with whatever that topic was. And again, like with a very small staff, it was a way to spread out in a city and get different perspectives from different neighborhoods. And, and, it, and again, it's disarming kind of like the what's for dinner question. Um, talking to a fish is different than talking to a reporter who's sticking a microphone in your nose. Um, yeah, so for me, it just, um, it felt like the right kind of approach in New Orleans. Um, and I think it really depends on where you live, like how to do that. So um, more recently, I've lived in Los Angeles and I've always wanted to kind of create like uh, a news wall, like a news mural, which I know would, you know, the next morning have graffiti on it, but to kind of keep returning and introducing questions and conversations there. Um, uh, so I'm always trying to think about, yeah, like how do you make it appropriate to where you live? And I'm sure, it, you know, I'm always fascinated when I pass through Arcata by the um, bulletin board at the co-op. I feel like I learned so much about Arcata and I love bulletin boards and it seems like one that still gets used. And uh, I always stare at that forever. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, how would I, you know, how would I be part of this bulletin board in kind of a news way? Always kind of, I always think about that when I'm staring at it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's how do you fit in, you know? Like, how do you fit in? How do you um, make people feel like you're one of them or at the very least you're paying attention? I love that uh, aspect of the community art. I've seen, uh, I think I was in the Bay and I saw um, like a big wall that had, that was blank, ultimately looked like a chalkboard. And then there was a question that basically you would fill in the blanks and there was maybe like 60 sets of the same question so that each individual could go and write in their own response. And it was things like, blank, 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 make me happy, or, um, you know, blank is my favorite thing to do, or, you know, things like that, and it was, it was a really cool way to get the community involved, just a little bit further than the bulletin board, like you bring it up, um, and I, I think that's really cool. Yeah, there's another thing, I'll add the link here, uh, this one actually turned up who created this, You'll see these all over the country. There are these chalkboards that say before I die and you can write in the rest of the sentence. She actually turned out lived down the street from me in New Orleans. And so we had a, 
uh, sign summit one day to talk about our ideas. Um, but yeah, totally. There's so many things to try and not all of them will succeed, but I think um, that's what's fun about it. You don't know, you know, what's going to click. Yeah, absolutely. And um, so before you need to go, I know you could commit 30 minutes. Um, I'm wondering if you could highlight maybe just a couple of the biggest takeaways from this project, um, good, bad, et cetera. Totally, 100%. Um, I think, you know, it's a lot of work, more than I budgeted for, you know. Um, and what comes back from the community won't always make you happy. <laughs> you know, it could be, it could be tough. But um, I always felt like the effort was worth it. And I'm always kind of like, I'm proud of the fact that I've lived a lot of places. I know a lot of places. I've lived in other countries. And at the same time, I'm always bummed that I haven't, as an adult, lived anywhere like super long, like 10 years or something where like, I really could claim that place. I could, you know, I mean, when you're talking about New Orleans, sometimes you're talking about seven generations of a single family. So there's actually no way to, to be local there, but, um, but yeah, always wanting to feel like, okay, I've tried things over time. I've learned what makes sense, what works, and I'm still here and I'm still iterating. And um, so I think there's some value in, in those of you who are really embedded in a community doing this sort of thing. I think it means more probably. Um, that's something I think a lot about. I also like, the thing I like best is just learning what other people are trying. So there's a woman who works with us now in Phoenix. Um, and during the pandemic, just as it was starting, she was getting all these um, WhatsApp messages from family members and friends. She's a reporter and they were like, is this fake news? What does this mean? You know, what's happening? And so she turned it into um, what she calls cafecito, which every day at 2 p.m., her WhatsApp group is at its limit, 260 participants, and they come for an hour and there's usually an expert and there's a topic and she has this like, you know, virtual coffee with them, which I just, I love. And now she's doing it as some restrictions fall away. Um, she's doing a little tour and doing it in person and people are showing up because they've really benefited from the service she created. Um, there's a project in, in Liberia, Africa that I love that's called Front Page. I think it's called Front Page. And it's a traffic circle and this guy has this chalkboard in the middle and he hides behind it and he writes the news and then he, he flips the board around. And so he's literally creating like a running uh, front page of a newspaper and people stop or walk up to it. And during things like the, the Ebola pandemic, um, that's how people, you know, knew what resources to access and stuff like that. Um, so I, I think my favorite thing is what's the next thing to try? Um, what's the next way to connect with people um, who's kind of being innovative? Uh, I always find that really interesting. And I think right now, like with the news and the internet being such a vast space, um, uh, sometimes I just feel a little overwhelmed, as I'm sure all of you do being in that space. And so I think more and more, I just think about how to be offline because I think it might connect with people differently. I think text messaging worked because it, it, wasn't, um, it wasn't an email, you know, it wasn't something on social media, it felt more personal. So I almost feel like coming back to like as much as possible um, community spaces to share news, um, bulletin boards, things like that. I just wonder if with the internet being such a, a scattered you know, space, if some of those spaces will become more and more important. And I'll just say the last thing, every time I do one of these assessments, word of mouth always comes up uh, really high in terms of how a lot of communities still talk to each other, especially immigrant communities in other languages. And I always just think that's such an interesting space to try and exist in. So for instance, when I launched my recording sculptures in New Orleans, 
The first one was on a woman's porch because she sat there all day and people passed by and had conversations. And it was just like, yeah, this is where this belongs. <laughs> and sure enough, people came by and it was hot and there were popsicles. And, um, and then she started interviewing people because she kind of liked the attention. And um, so I just love like that sort of thing. Like when you're actually connecting with people, um, that's when I, I get excited and I feel useful. Awesome. I'm wondering if anyone else has any questions. I'll check on Facebook. Nope, I don't see any. So yeah, uh, just one last call for any of our viewers that want to ask any questions um, before we say thank you when we move on um, to talk about what Access Humboldt's doing with our listening post. Um. Thank you all for having me. I'm sorry I can't stick around to hear about this, but you're recording it, so I will watch it because I would like to know more. Um, and uh, yeah, it's so cool to see you all. Good to see you, David. Um, thanks for inviting me. And uh, next visit, hopefully I'll be able to like buy you all a sandwich at the co-op or something and we can talk in the, in the plaza. Jesse, this was great. I hear there might be a meeting in May for the first time in two years. Hopefully you can find yourself yeah. on that invitee list. All right. I will. Uh, I'll, I'll work my way on there, David. Right on. <laughs> we'll take care until we connect again. Yeah. Thank you for being here. Have, we really appreciate it. Have a great weekend, you all. And thanks so much. I really appreciated being here. Yes. Thank you for coming and for all this work you're doing. Hmm. Fight the good right. fight. Good luck, everybody. All right, I'm gonna share my screen and I will uh, share uh, just a little bit about Access Humboldt's listening post. Um, so we started our listening post, which we call the Redwoods listening post because we live amongst the Redwoods. Um, and it started last summer, 2020. So two summers, I don't know, time's weird in the pandemic. <laughs> but summer of 2020, um, we started the Redwoods Listening Post. Um, and it was a program that started with Access Humboldt um, in Inner News as a member of the Community Voices Coalition, um, which the Community Voices Coalition also started um, that summer of 2020 with a focus on COVID information sharing, um, as well as creating some solutions-based uh, journalism locally. Uh, Access Humboldt was providing distribution and translation services for the Community Voices Coalition. So we were able to translate um, a number of articles into Hmong and Spanish, um, you know, and we had chose those two languages because we found um, very high numbers of community members belonging um, to those communities and speaking those languages. Uh, the Redwoods Listening Post assists with coalition organizing efforts, establishes new partnerships with underrepresented groups, and provides resources like grants or stipends for local media, media and news curation in relation uh, to the community at large, as well as COVID-19. Um, we've been able to partner with a, a bunch of really awesome organizations, which we'll get into in a minute, but um, those who are involved all ultimately have access to um, Access Humboldt services, internews, editors on call, uh, production training and support, equipment, translation and distribution. Um, the project was managed by an editorial team that was made up of Humboldt County community members, staff from Access Humboldt and Internews, as well as uh, story grantee representatives. Um, the Redwoods Listening Post brings forward new perspectives and accurate, insightful coverage of local issues. And the project aims to support underserved and marginalized communities to identify and help address local issues and challenges in the ways that they locate and um, feed off of news. Um, so with, we got original funding from Humboldt Area Foundation and the Wild Rivers Community Foundation and that launched our pilot program. 
in that pilot program, we were able to um, collaborate with El Lenador, which is a student-led Spanish publication, Redwood Voice, uh, which is a news youth video group out of Del Norte County, um, as well as um, work with Internews for translations and Access Humboldt was kind of the hub that was kind of building out this project on that team. We actually have our team here in this meeting. So, hey team, we had Jane Callahan, who is a board member with Access Humboldt. We had David Frank uh, from Internews and then myself and Sean. Uh, and this first little pilot went by really quick. We did a lot of development. We were working on, you know, how do we make an easy program for people to use and utilize, but also how do we provide um, support services to really uh, you know, create some strong content and information sharing processes. Um, so with the help from local storytellers and community leaders through our collaborations, we were able to help identify and urge local solutions to the challenges brought about by the pandemic. And um, we were able to, like I said before, create sources of information readily available in the languages and in the methods that these marginalized communities needed it. Um, so now we are a little bit further in the project. We ended up doing a second kind of pilot run um, and we were able to create some more uh, community co uh, collaborations. Uh, so let's see, we partnered with Native American Pathways out of the Hoopa Valley, the Mars Project from Ink People Center of the Arts, and uh, we got to create a podcast called the Community Redwoods Report, um, who we also got to partner with a local uh, content creator who's also on the call, uh, Nate. So him and David were able, and Izzy, I think, right? Okay. So there's three people working on that project, um, looking to, you know, just talk with our collaborators, create a new platform for information sharing and telling stories. Um, we were trying to make sure that we were hitting, you know, all the media options we had, right? So Leonard Dora was creating print, um, Redwood's Voice was creating video, uh, we have the podcast creating audio and then the Mars program. Uh, they also do video and audio, but they actually created a class uh, for us to share. Uh, so we had some kind of trainer making the training kind of videos that we created so that other folks could also enhance their media creation. Uh, through these partnerships, we were able to bring multimedia coverage of communities' needs when they needed them. Through this ongoing project, we hope to foster and support healthy communities with an emphasis on public health and safety through the sharing of information and a battle against misinformation. Uh, civic engagement through access to democracy, economic development through paid opportunities for content creation and content sharing, culture and arts as we reached as we were working to support disenfranchised, underrepresented communities of the North Coast uh, through education and training opportunities like uh, the trainings we did with uh, the Mars Project, CMC trainings uh, at the community center, our access class, or the youth hands-on productions that we were making with Mars Project as well. Um, so that's just a summary of the project. We're hoping to build it out uh, and continue this work. Uh, we're hoping that it will take many forms and that we're able to collaborate with some new folks. Um, we have been talking about digital fellowships with the Lenador um, participants in hopes to uh, you know, give them some tools to take their journalism up and beyond and into the multimedia sphere. And um, we were also hoping to create, uh, continue working with Redwood Voice with trans translation services, as well as we've talked about ways that our local libraries can get involved. Um, so there's lots of dreaming going on right now, um, lots of development with that same crew and, um, you know, 
we're hoping to get some more people involved so that we can really develop this project into a tool for the whole North Coast as well as our Humboldt County communities. So I will stop my share. I wanna invite Sean to add anything if he wants to speak um, or if anyone has any questions. Um, oh yes, California Endowment did yep. uh, fund us for our second kind of pilot project that we had going on. Yep, that, that was pretty much what I wanted to make sure that we um, sort of acknowledge that we've had strong support from foundations to help us launch this. We've also, I, I want to really congratulate Mo and the, um, and the outreach efforts. We found really willing collaborators who really would love to continue and do more. So we're very encouraged while we sort of went through our funding cycle and now we're in re, you know, reimagination mode. I think we're also very, very much encouraged to feel that we've developed some capacity that you know continues to be available and some uh, relationships that of uh, people who are really excited to continue. So I think a lot of that has to do with the leadership that you've provided, Mo. So thanks for that. And um, that's all I wanted to add. <laughs> I'm looking forward to hearing from uh, from David and Nate about. I guess the only other quick thing I would add is we're. We are trying to work into broadcast TV world, you know, the commercial news, and we've had some positive indications and there have been some interesting developments there with the Cox Media Group and having some of their anchors do Spanish language reporting on the side and building collaborations there. Um, and the radio piece, uh, to me as an old TV access person, the radio has been underestimated. The opportunities we found of collaboration with KMUD, with KFUG in Crescent City, um, and I think um, the project that Nate and the team did, you know, the, the reporting. Um, anyway, we're, that I guess we're going to hear about next, so thanks. Thank you, Mo and, and Sean. Um, Mo, you really, you really set it up nicely, providing all the background, the context, the, the element that, uh, you know, immense outreach to the community, but during COVID, there was, there was some struggle. Um, with getting people in alignment, harmonizing on on you know, moving forward. Obviously, um, it's not entirely over, but but it has evolved. Um, so we, I think, hopefully anticipate more opportunities to collaborate with people, um, but also build on what we've done so far. Uh, so I hope Nate uh, is able to to uh, join and. Um, I, I want to say I want to congratulate Nate. I think as as the pr person who was the producer, content producer for the first ten episodes of the pilot, um, I think they, they, it was a great success. And uh, now I think we are seven or so episodes into uh, live uh, KZZH broadcast. So taking the Redwoods Community Report podcast that was broadcast on KZZH uh, in a recorded fashion. Now um, it's transitioned to live, to, to live shows. Um, Nate does, does uh, the pitch the best, I think, uh, way better than myself when it comes to what community uh, live events mean. And, and I think that that supplements or builds on kind of what Jesse said earlier about the, the origin story of, of the listening post concept. So we have, we have Redwoods listening post, we have Redwoods community report. We're trying to build on that tradition, that outreach, that engagement. Um, partners across the region, we, we've, you know, in, uh, preliminary steps, uh, more advanced steps and actually real successful collaboration like the organizations that uh, that Mo identified. So uh, Nate, I'm not sure if you're able to come on, but can you tell if you can, uh, can you speak a little bit to the current project, um, to to the radio broadcasting that we've been doing and kind of your your the pitch that you give on the show, I think is a really good pitch to share. And it tells people, it invites people to, to be part of it. Well, uh, thank you, Dave. Um, let me just touch on the, the first spiel, and, and that is the importance of radio, community radio specifically. Um, and it, it, it can be a community solidifier and, and uh, where community comes together and builds and creates solutions for the community. Um, we saw that uh, before KHSU went down. We see that in Southern Humboldt with KMUD. I had the opportunity to work at KMUD for four years and it is the community hub. And it is vitally important to have community radio 
uh, in the, in our community. And so that is the basis of my whole uh, efforts. And so when this Redwoods listening post started, I got really excited and I said, it, it, it's such a great project and started getting involved in doing the podcast. And uh, the, the whole intent was to create the platform for the community conversation on the radio. So in other words, um, like Jesse was saying, uh, you know, they had those sculptures with a microphone in them and people would just come up to them. Dude, that's a great idea. And it's going to take a lot for us to get that done up here. But until then, I figured the Redwoods community, community report can be that platform. So um, let me just read to you what I read every uh, on at the beginning of every episode. As part of the Redwoods Listening Post, and with help from nonprofits, Access Humboldt, and Internews, this is a new locally focused news magazine radio program. Solutions journalism will be a major focus of the program. The goal: coverage of perspectives on local issues from those who are underserved and underrepresented by what is currently available on local radio. The intent is to showcase local issues through a collection of articles, opinions, and stories created by local community citizens, journalists, and media partners. We hope to create a program that will highlight our, uh, highlight our diverse community of voices and bring back the on-air community dialogue. That is the whole intent of the program. Um, as Dave had mentioned, we did uh, 10 pre-recorded pilot runs, so that was kind of like a podcast style. We've taken that structure and and we are now doing it live. Um, we currently do a 30 minute live program from on Thursday evenings from six to 6.30 um, with the intent to expand into a full hour once we get going and get some more contributors and take phone calls. Taking phone calls is very, very important to me. Um, we just aren't quite there technically yet and which has been the great part about uh, yeah, we've done seven, seven live episodes so far, and each time we're learning a little bit more on the structure, the technical aspects of it. Um, so, so it's still in its, its, its beta phase, but it's coming around. Um, I am hoping, I'm still trying to find ways to find more contributors. Um, you know, community citizens that got something to say can come on our airwaves um, if they want to do like a little story, um, one of the other things that I always uh, pitch in, in the program is that we can't help you. I would, I, I don't want to be cre uh, bringing the content to the show. I don't want it to be my show. I want it to be the community show. I want to help people contribute to the show. And then once they start doing that, you know, in a perfect world, we'd have, you know, people who um, I help produce a new story or uh, an opinion piece or something that we can present on the radio program. And then what I would like to do is take those folks and encourage them and work with them to have their own half hour live radio program on KZZH. In other words, building up the local content, uh, local live content on KZZH and uh, uh, creating the, the, the community hub that I know KZZH KZZH can be. Hey, Nate, I have a quick question for you. When you were the uh, public affairs director at, at KMUD, can you tell us, I, I forgot the number, that's, I don't mean to put you on the spot, approximation, approximately how many volunteer contributors were there, uh, if you include both music and public affairs content, do you remember how many community members actually, you know, volunteered to be part of that uh, enterprise? Do you mean uh, hosts of shows that were on the air? Yeah, programmers. Yeah, music and talk. Yeah, two hundred and fifty. So there you go. That's just Southern humble people showing up at the studio, day you know twenty four seven to provide that content voluntarily. That does not include the up to two to four thousand people who would contribute all the time, or who would show up to mow the lawn, or to do the dishes, or you know the events that we'd have. We'd had you were Dave. You volunteered several times to work events down there. Um, so yeah, it is, that's where people hang out at KMUD. They hang out there and talk about what's going on in the community. It, it's a, it's a resource hub. So yeah, 250, about 250 programmers. 
and, and I'm not interviewing okay. you. I apologize for this format. It is taking no, no a turn, turn, turn to a conversation slash interview. But um, I know one of the guests, I'm just going to use this as an example for illustrative purposes. One of the guests recently that was on the Redwoods Community Report was uh, promoting an upcoming event, which is called the Bartow Project, which is a local WIAT, I believe, uh, tribal member. If I got the tribe wrong, I'm mistaken. He, he was a, a, a nationally renowned, world renowned uh, artist, uh, we are tribal member. And so this is a tribute to his work, a four part documentary series. But but the reason I mention this, it, it, besides the fact that it's an upcoming event that people can participate in to see, but it was four small what what is has been produced in this project four short videos um, that combine into one presentation. Um, and, and, and the reason I'm mentioning it is because the person who was the guest on the show reached out afterwards and said, I would like to do a podcast. I would like to work with Access Humboldt to, to develop my skills and communicate more broadly across the region about other things I'm working on. So do you mind, I know you said it a minute ago, but can you just say a little pitch again about how that might work out for Access Humboldt and, and for the community to get more engaged with uh, media conversation? Uh how what am i answering um so just to just to make it crystal clear that um you, you've got lots of experience with training um at down at kmud and access humble ha, as a resource has has training programs in place and that people actually can it's a media lab and the media lab is an incubator for ideas and participation um and just I, you know i'm putting you on the spot to say something good about uh how how uh to welcome the community to be part of it well, you pretty much just said it all right there. Yeah, Dave, you already you already did it. Um, but if you don't mind me intervening for a sure, second, um, I know Nate was able to observe maybe some of the sessions, the previous session, but didn't get to participate as much. Um, I, I was impressed on the the uh, both of our calls at radio. You know that Joseph Orozco and the KIDE participation, and just the notion. I know we've. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're seeing this traction. I didn't realize that um, KFUG is now producing a daily Del Norte newscast. So every day there's a local radio newscast for Del Norte, and um, they're going to start sharing it with us. So you'll be able to hear it down here in Humboldt as well. And I think that's part of the project that you've really um, fully embraced that I really appreciate is it's sharing content, you know, across you know, whoever's creating content, it should be shared as widely as possible, especially news and information. It has a, you know, has a shelf life. It's not, um, it needs to be shared to maximize its value. So um, the, I guess the, the point I'm getting to is that the radio piece, and I'm sorry, Nate got taken away probably by some work responsibility, but um, I think that piece of it, and it, it's a, interesting experience because I think radio has had to deal more and more with podcasting, you know, going online and virtual. We had on the earlier calls, we had Humboldt Hot Air participated and talked about their effort. Um, maybe David, I don't know if you have a perception on this, but there's something about audio, people interacting with media so differently through print, through video, through podcasts, through, you know, audio. Um, it feels like there's a reorganizing going on in the way that people are informed. I really appreciated Jesse's presentation earlier too. I, I wanted to make a quick observation and just say, I, I should have said this earlier, that basically a lot of our motivation for Access Humboldt is very much tied to the same kinds of motivations that are expressed so beautifully in that work, right? It's, is there a creative way for communities to find their own voice? And to really appreciate that that's going to be different in every community and you might not always want to hear what people have to say but you if the goal is to empower people's voice then that's what you do um, so the active listening the deep listening as he described it the um, that assessment that you and um, jane and internews brought to access humboldt and our community i think has been really meaningful in our frame the way we look at all this going forward um, Sean, if you if you don't mind, I, I so part of our participation in the um, that community ecosystem assessment that we did in Eureka um, was going out into the the community 
walking the streets, going to places where people frequent, like the park, Redwood, uh, the zoo there at the park, mm -hmm. um, a lot, lots of places, speaking to lots of people. And Jesse had said that, you know, one of the things that he was uh, always uh, uh, witnessing or experiencing was that people will say word of mouth is actually one of the top ways that folks get information. Um, so, so that that's a little bit of a difficult uh, place to break into, uh, you know, arena, because obviously word of mouth is not something we have much control over. But another yeah. one of the, sorry, go ahead. Well, I just to put a, a, a perspective on that, I think people would say my friends. I get it from my friends, and yeah. they read the news and they tell me what you know what they think of the news, and that's where I get my information. So it's not like their friends made it up, or you know, word of mouth starts somewhere. Yeah. Anyway, so sorry, yeah. I didn't, I don't know, that's fine, that's you, fine. But just to say, there's a dynamic there, right? It's yeah. like the old thought leader approach. If you could just inform the right people, you can influence decisions. Exactly. And that's what we would hear from people is, oh, like in certain communities, it's, oh, I listen to this person. And that's, mm -hmm. that's the sort of the, whatever, alpha voice that the beginning of the conversation. Um, but, but I was recently exposed to a pretty interesting idea that parallels what we learned that day two summers ago uh, in the park when we spent, there was a group of young people that were there and they asked us what we were doing. And we, so we decided, all right, well, let's ask them their opinion. Where do they get their local news? Where do they get their information from? When I say young, uh, because I'm much older now than probably the last time I referred to young folks, these we're talking real young. We're talking like high school age people. And uh, that's so, you know, much younger than, than at least myself. Um, and they said, oh, well, we basically use Instagram and uh, that's it. You know, we don't like, Facebook's passe. We don't watch TV, no radio. We got, we do the whole Spotify thing and Instagram. And that's two years ago. And since then, um, just in the last two days or so, I heard that uh, the White House uh, convened 30 TikTok opinion leaders who report on media. And, um, and mm. so, so these insights, I'm going to refer to somebody and, and I'll try to keep it brief, of course. Um, but, but her name is Jules Turpak. She's a TikTok creator. She was one of those 30 people who was invited to the White House. She was interviewed uh, by someone named Marshall Kozlov. And it's about an 11 or so, maybe 15 minute interview. You can find it if you if you look for breaking points, Marshall Kosloff and Jules Turpak, you can find her on TikTok. But her poignant insight was that, um, I'm gonna go down a couple quick things. Young people wake up and check TikTok. It's the primary info source for millions of people across America, which means young people in our community too. Um, it's great to have a variety of perspectives and to have high levels of engagement the fact that the White House invited these 30 people, these 30 opinion leaders is evidence that powerful people are paying attention to these content providers and their influence. Basically people make short little videos where they express their opinion and lots of people comment on it. And the AI algorithms multiply that by commenters get linked to each other. Yet these sources are not vetted. So there's the very real risk to young folks that they'll be uh, getting misinf misinformation and disinformation, mm -hmm. um, unfiltered and unfact-checked. Um, so there are thoughtful, independent voices out there who do hours of research for just a few minutes of content. Um, we need to be aware of this for future efforts to include the younger generation in our conversations. And so I brought, you know, I, I know I, uh, took us a little bit into left field, but the idea is that we, just like the information ecosystem, ecosystem assessment that we did two years ago, we have to meet people where they are. And an observation I make about this is that we're talking about this is already happening. So there are, are already millions of young people that this is how they're getting their information detached from right. the current and existing information flows. And it's just, it, it's a twofold. One is that we are aware of this is happening. But two, if as a community, as Access Humble, as Redwoods Listening Post, as the future of media in our community, as a way to fight misinformation and disinformation, all these things combined leads us to, to, the, to the fact that we can invite people to participate in our conversation. So when Access Humble moves to, for example, CR, College of the Redwoods, in the next coming weeks and months, we will have access to 7,000 students potentially who will be part of this younger generation or maybe more in tune or inclined generation to participate, provide content, provide opinion, sources of feedback, sources of, of uh, you know, aspiration. And so I'm just throwing that out there that that's just one example of uh, something that we ought to be aware of. 
I appreciate you bringing it up. I think we talked about including uh, some discussion about disinformation and the impact of it, because in the changing media landscape, it's it's become more and more of an issue, right? I think the whole pandemic and the role of misinformation as having direct public health impacts, uh, the infodemic, you know, sort of term comes to mind. Um, so that's something that it's like eternal vigilance, right? It's like, I don't know what to say about it other than yeah. it matters and we need to keep paying attention. And there are correlations between local people trust local sources and are able to hold local information sources more accountable. Like you kind of know if the local news isn't covering something in your community wrong, like you, you, you know, and you know who to talk to, that the reporter might live in your community and so forth. That's one thing I think we really appreciate about these local media collaborations and a big focus of our work is localism. You know, how do you make sure we're not just improving everybody's access to voices from afar, um, which would be nice and cur the curation, I think people appreciate public broadcasting for that and NPR. It's like, here's a curation layer that I can, that some people trust that, right? It's like, okay, somebody's made sure that this is more true than untrue <laughs> uh, as opposed to the internet, which can be the wild west of information, right? You don't know whether to believe it or not. And even worse, kind of as you're pointing out, the algorithms and the, the way that platforms monetize viewership leads to a very unhealthy dynamic where misinformation gets accelerated. It's more inflammatory speech is, prefer is preferred by the platform because the platform makes more money off of people who are upset and clicking on things more <laughs> than people who are thoughtfully considering other people's views. So there's a trick, there's a problem, a, a sort of structural problem there, I think that you're pointing to about misinformation as our sources go online and become monetized through algorithms, you know, we need transparency to know what is that algorithm? How is that being decided? Um, and what can we do to influence that? And how do we improve our own diet, our own information diet, so that we know that the information that we're getting has been vetted or curated, you know, in a way that makes it reliable and trustworthy. So, so Sean, you touched on a few of the points that uh, the Internews' president, Jeannie Borgo, she uh, gave a presentation about a year ago. Um, she was involved in a panel. Um, I, 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 shared, I shared the link with Mo. I don't know if that's something that we can do today or if we're just going to share the link to the group. Um, but but it, it goes really far uh, into explaining that this is a global problem. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know, Mo, is that something we're going to share today or do you just want to share the link um, in the chat? Um, I'll, I'll let you decide since this is your ship to steer. Um, but in the meantime, while she contemplates that, um, I, I'll mention that just, just to kind of to, to explain how, you know, it affects every each community, like sort of bringing the threads together. Internews has a project called Rooted in Trust. Um, which was designed to uh, address the, the chaos and confusion, I'm quoting, around the world and put vulnerable communities, uh, you know, in, COVID pandemic created that chaos. And, um, and so this project is in multiple countries, uh, Lebanon, Mali, Colombia, Sudan, Brazil, Democratic Republic of Congo, Iraq, South Sudan, Zimbabwe, um, lots of places. And uh, what it really does is um, it, speaks to people it doesn't so they do eco information ecosystem assessments and they speak to people in their language through trusted sources in their community and and each area has their own solution based on what works best for them to track misinformation and to address misinformation and to have a trusted uh, resource in the community to engage the community to to kind of prevent negative feedback loops and fight them with positive feedback loops they were able to track 19,000 rumors in 14 languages, reaching 81 million people across the world with relevant information. So they'd put out rumor bulletins, 130 rumor bulletins, 500 radio broadcasts, 400 mixed media stories, 480, sorry, uh, use, uh, partnering with 550 local media organizations around the world. Um, so uh, 
one last little stat here. Um, they did 4,670 listening groups where they actually listened to people um, and, and really figured out what people wanted to know and needed, needed, you know, wanted to hear about. And I'm just using this as just one example of a, of a very hyper local community project, but that is repeatable. That, so I have a, a little bit of a, a, a vision that someday our listening posts in the United States, so not just here on the North Coast, but the others maybe across, like Jesse referred to the one in Fresno. It's possible that we're able to kind of collaborate and share best practices and figure out ways that things that are important to us in our community might also be important to other communities across the state or certainly across the region. Um, so I, I just wanted to give that as an example that if you, if we, you know, sort of if you build it they will come and that's i think our intention circling back to the our redwoods listening post we we're building it we're doing what we can do and and we are hopeful that we can uh, collaborate with a diverse set of people across our community to 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 serve those information needs we, we we don't have an information desert here but we but there is an infodemic and so i think we ought to you know uh be thankful for the things we've accomplished so far uh, as a team and as an organization, knowing that, uh, like you said, Sean, the eternal vigilance here will be is required, and this is something that we roll up our sleeves and we really participate in, dive into, and 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 make, you know, make progress where and how we can. Yes, thank you, uh, David and Nate, for everything you guys added. I um, think it's crucial that we highlight that we are talking to communities in their languages, in the methods that they deem uh, most accessible. Because I think that's one of the main points of the listening post, um, especially hearing Jesse talk about it too. Uh, you know, communities talk in different ways and we have to tap into those ways in order to serve them. So um, that is kind of it for our presentation. I wanna kind of just open the floor to let folks chat. If you have any questions or comments, now would be a great time. I'm gonna stop our recording. Um, so there's some you know, security in the space while we're talking. Um, but thanks for everyone for listening out there in cyberspace. Thanks Mo, well done.